All right, everyone. Welcome back to another episode. Today, I have Morgan Fallon with us. So welcome to the show, man. Hey, thank you. For Good sure. To be here. Grateful to have you on. Uh, so yeah, for everybody watching, we did color coordinate. I called him before and we we're both in blue. So that that did happen. A couple, um, <laughs> yeah, a couple months in advance. Um, but no, so before we dive in, though, if you could just tell us a little bit more about you and what you do. Yeah, sure. Um, I am, uh, you know, my name is Morgan Fallon. I'm a uh, producer and director uh, and cinematographer. Um, I work mostly in documentary television um, and uh, mostly on, you know, serialized uh, documentary TV shows that focus on culture, food, people. You know, those are the stories I really like to tell. Uh, most of that work is with hosts, host based shows. I'm uh, currently on a project that is uh, is not any of those things. So I'm doing a, a three part series about uh, Adidas and Puma right now. So, Got it. All right. Yeah, we're having a lot of fun with that one. So, so, so yeah, that's it. So earlier on, I, I always like to kind of start here because yeah. I, I always find it interesting is like when you were younger, is this at all what you saw yourself doing or that you like enjoyed or when you were younger, did you have a completely different, or maybe you didn't have a vision at all. A lot of kids have no clue what they're going to do. So how young? Cause I was going to be a oh. pro skater for a long time. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'd say, I feel like middle, like 13, maybe. Yeah, I think man. When you yeah. Started, like, you're like, yeah, maybe I could do that. Maybe I could. Yeah. It was high school. You know, um, I, uh, I originally I was I was always into like art and that's where it kind of clicked for me. Can't say I was like the best student um, outside of, uh, of kind of the art room, uh, but I did really well there. And I, and I was actually focused on ceramics. And like originally that was it. I was going to like go to Alfred University and become like a famous uh, ceramicist, you know. And, uh, and I, did pretty well. I had like pieces in the National Art Show and stuff. I'm so, like pretty proud of my high school uh, ceramics career. Um, but about middle of high school, uh, it just, it just clicked. And, and my mom was a writing teacher at the, at the high school, uh, Brewster Academy, private high school in uh, New England. And she used to use films to, to teach uh, intensive writing. Uh, so it was a lot of like watching films and analyzing, writing about it. And, uh, and all of a sudden it was just like, that's, I, I mean, in terms of a medium, if you want to tell stories, it's like infinitely more powerful than a uh, wheel throwing. Uh, yeah. Ceramic. So I think that's what was originally, you know, exciting to me. And and I got really into film and went to film school and that was it. I've never really, you know, I've only had one job that wasn't in, in the film and television industry. And that was working for my dad in the summers. So yeah, it. that's it. All right. So a few questions. You know, is there i'm sure there are there's got to be in every niche there always is but for like ceramics is yeah. there like what does that career ultimately look like is there is are, there's some rich people in that career there has to be oh right? absolutely yeah if you're if you're like if you really hammer it and you're really good and you're like um adam silverman you know these like there's like famous ceramicists and i don't know okay. many of them. i'm like kind of way out of that world but i did happen to work with one who's like i mean you're talking about those cats are selling pieces for you know six figure pieces high six figures yeah so and uh, and so you can really you can crush it in that, you know, and then there's other people that have branched out and built, you know, companies, you know, that that produce ceramics and do really well. So, like, of course, like anything, yeah, you, you can crush it, you know, yeah, likely you're you're probably making, <laughs> you know, likely you're probably making some some sweet looking coffee mugs and selling them in Kenny Buck, Fort Maine, you know, yeah, yeah, <laughs> scraping out a decent living and and hey. You don't have to go into hey. a, you know an office every day, and you you do what you love, hey, you know. So that's kind of I think that's kind of the more likely route, you know. But yeah, you can yeah. kill it just like anything else. So then you ended up going to school, but I'm curious right. on what like when you found success in your creative career of like directing and stuff was. Do you think like school was a big component of it, or was it more like relationship building? Obviously, talent relationship building. Okay. I yeah. yeah, you know, like I went to Emerson uh, College. It's a great school. It's very technical. It's hands-on. You know, year one, we're like producing stuff and getting your hands on actual equipment uh, and being on set. And that that's really important because when you get out into the industry, it's like 
you know, you're young in the industry. You're going to try a lot of different things. You come in as kind of a production assistant. People are like, can you do this? Can you do this? Can you do this? Can you do this? I, I was able to do all of those things. So I don't want to say it's just relationship building, yeah. but the, the really important thing about that was like, you have a whole group of peers that are going out into the industry. And so you get this de facto network right from the beginning. Yeah. Uh, and that's a school that's very focused on kind of one thing and that's, that's entertainment, you know? And so that really paid off for me. It was those connections that got me my initial leads and my initial start. Okay. So there, and then did you like, cause you're, I know you're in California. So is California right. like, obviously that's like the place to go if you want to go into that industry. So yeah, you, yeah. Meet, you yeah. met other people there then that obviously like propelled things. Yeah, definitely. I came out like I was still in school uh, when I started coming out here. So I'd come out and work in the sun. That is the biggest coffee mug. My God. Look at that thing. Wow. You are my <laughs> I got it for my dad, but he like left it down here. So I... Like something out of Alice in Wonderland or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, the uh, engagement on YouTube. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. um, so, uh, yeah, I came out here while I... I was still in school and just started working at the studios in the summer. And so I I'd just come out in PA in the summer, uh, production assistant, you know, and just try to get a foothold. Uh, but yeah, you, you know, eventually again, all my peers graduate and, and it was the, the first really big lead was, um, so I got a, I got a call out of nowhere from a friend from school who said, Hey, you know, a friend of a friend said that, you know, Michael Mann needs a production assistant for like three days. Uh, and I was like, Ab- I mean, absolutely. <laughs> you know, and I went into that and I was just like, I am not leaving this office. And, uh, and I, I, mean, I they must have thought I was uh, psychotic. I, I'm like, staying, I was staying during those three days, I'm like, stay until like midnight cleaning the copy room, like scrubbing the refrigerator, anything I, I mean, literally anything I can do. And at the end of the three days, they're like, hey, we're, you know, we just got greenlit on uh, Ali, the Will Smith. Uh, Michael Mann directed uh, Columbia Pictures film. And yeah. uh, do you want to be a PA on it? No, so, yeah, of course, you know. And then that led to me being Michael's assistant and um, and he was there for two years, you know. Yeah, and then, and then that kind of rest is history in a sense from there. Yeah, you know, history, but like it's it's up and down, man, like anything else, you know. It yeah. wasn't like, it wasn't like everything was just, you know, sweet from there, you know. I, I that was a real incredible entry point. Uh, I learned quite a bit. I uh, worked really hard, and but it it wasn't documentary, and I kind of found documentary after that, and realized that that was really kind of where where my heart was and what my path was. Got it. And actually, uh, and I'll talk to you about this out. I just had an idea because one of my clients we just came out with a book, and we're looking for somebody for a documentary. I literally, I hadn't thought about it before, but I'll run it by you afterwards. So just to- all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what are talking about documentaries? Yeah. What are two questions on that? Is what are um, like the things that you like most about them? Like you know, obviously different than like your normal movie. So like, what draws you to documentaries in general? And then what are some of the ones that you're most like uh, well known for that you were involved with? Yeah, I, I mean, um, when I say documentaries, you know, there's there's documentaries, there's documentary feature films, and then there's documentary television. And I really do look at it as different from what we call like the modern kind of reality television, you know, genre. Th- those are largely produced shows where you're basically writing a script and then going out and, and making that happen with real people in a real setting, you know. Uh, what I like to do and and where I really found myself was in working with real people in real context, doing a ton of kind of research on them and then putting together uh, a show, an, an episode of a show. The, the ones I'm, you know, kind of most well known for uh, are um, I did uh, Meat Eater with Steve Rinella, which is on Netflix. Um that was a really, really interesting show. It was kind of early in my career. We really were able to build something from the ground up there that is very scrappy, very kind of organic. That's a show where you'd go out into the field with no script, no concept of what you're doing, uh, other than, you know, you got a camera, 
Uh, we were hunting, uh, we were cooking, we were teaching about conservation, we were teaching about how to use, you know, a whole animal, uh, and we'd get dropped off by, you know, a bush plane in central Alaska for 10 days, and whatever happened is what happened. And so it was a lot of using your wits, following story along the way, making sure that we're constructing something that is going to be viewable and, and editable and, and all those things like on the fly. It was great. It was super cool. Has Rogan been on that? On me either? Yeah, we took oh, we yeah. took Joe on his first uh first hunting trip in Montana. Yeah, that's where I first met uh where I first met Joe. Got it. And he's uh he's awesome. And that was so much fun, man. Uh that was actually a pretty profound experience because you get to see someone you know, I don't care who you are. And, you know, obviously Joe's a pretty tough dude, you know, but yeah. that first experience, you know, going out and hunting and like actually, you know, shooting an animal and watching it die in front of you, and carrying it out and butchering it and eating it and being part of that whole kind of process. That's a profound experience for anyone. And to watch someone as kind of, you know, present and aware and sharp as joe uh like go through that process was was pretty amazing on camera yeah sure. anyone can watch that episode that's an episode worth watching for sure yeah, yeah i think uh, i actually saw it on youtube i think or something so maybe totally. they're repurposing yeah, yeah. or something or maybe it was a clip of yeah. it it might have been a clip yeah, yeah, yeah. totally Sorry. exactly yeah. yeah yeah uh and so working with steve ranella that was amazing he's an amazing person uh and then uh you know, the big one, the, the one we always talk about is, is parts unknown. No, well, first no reservations and then parts unknown with uh, Anthony Bourdain. I spent 10 years uh, with him as part of, part of his team. Uh, and uh, that was phenomenal. I mean, you know, yeah. that's the lot. That's, that's, you hit, you hit Powerball. Uh, and in my industry, that was, that's hitting Powerball. And, and, you know, so rode that out as long as we could. You know, yeah. and then you know, lost Tony, unfortunately. And uh, but uh, man, what a hell of a ride! And uh, you know, miss him, miss that every day, you know. But uh, sure. extraordinary experience 70 countries, uh, you know, seven continents. Um, uh, you know, got to the South Pole and you know, and got to you know, got to the central DRC and. The Darien Gap and you know the finest restaurants in the world and you know the 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 dark corners of Tokyo. I mean, it was just incredible, dude. Yeah, I mean, do it. Yeah. I, I'd do it for free. You know, <laughs> that's awesome. I, I kept I kept saying that. You know, some of my first shows, we like. I remember my like third show or something. We were like in you know the Caribbean, like uh uh, uh the um. We were in like St. Vincent and the Grenadines, I think was the name of the show. And I thought the whole time, I'm like, you guys, like, you gonna pay me for this shit? Like, you guys, <laughs> really, yeah. like, hanging out on a catamaran, you know, like, just shoot a little, we'll hang out a little, eat some food, you know, have a couple beers. Like, <laughs> yeah. it's amazing. And, and I think that's where it really, for me, that's where it all really clicked and blossomed because what I realized in that is like what I truly love in my room truly passionate about is is people and and especially people who we within you know kind of our own context and whether that's you know growing up in America growing up in Japan growing up in wherever the people that we view as like the other you know the the other people the foreign people right and getting yeah. out there and working with them and realizing like man <laughs> there ain't no foreign people we're like we're all the same. Like we all got the same concerns. We're all into the same things. You know, we like, we can communicate over food and hanging out and getting an understanding of who each other are. And that was the real beauty of that show. And, and the thing I think that ultimately like I'm truly passionate about and the reason I love documentary so much is because you are cast out into the world. You get these jobs that you're like, know nothing about you know and get thrown into a world and the next thing you know you're hanging out with you know kind of ultra conservative ranchers in texas and you're like, oh, I don't know, this is gonna go and you get there and you're like oh, this, this, yeah people are great they're awesome you know like we may have some different political views but I'll, I'll, you know <laughs> I love them, man. and you know no and, yeah, uh, true, man. And being able to experience all of that is really amazing 
I think the biggest thing, because I remember, and I, I don't know if we talked about this when we had talked on the phone a few yeah. months ago, but basically like I, when I traveled in Europe and I went to Africa, yeah. it was, it's, if anybody listening or watching like has not traveled outside of their hometown and actually, and I'm not saying anything bad about, it, but like the hometown I come from, it's just, it's one of those small towns where a lot of people, they just stay like they don't. Yeah, me too. Yeah. yeah. Like, and yeah. I love my hometown. Like my parents still live there. I think, but like you should, me too. Yeah. yeah, you should like still venture out because Definitely. it's like the whole world. We all have similarities but the whole world is not exactly like your hometown in case you didn't yeah. like know. <laughs> and like, it's, yeah. it's so good to just like put yourself in different cultures. And I think you, you almost, for those experiences, they're like priceless. Like you really can't put a money tag on it. It's, yeah. you know what I mean? It's just so different than like the 70 countries and, or, or you know, however many places you went with this, like, again, I just don't think you can put an actual monetary value on those experiences. Like it's, there is a, you know, one time, like we kind of sat down and just joking around, we tried to, tried to figure out what it would cost to have experienced the things that we had experienced and it's in, it's in the tens and tens of millions of dollars. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like, you just, sure. there's no way to, to, I mean, yeah. there's no way to quantify it because you're also, you know, especially when you're working, you know, with, lucky enough to work with someone like Tony is like universally respected. And so it's not just that you're like, it's not that you can just like, you can, yeah, sure. We could go to Monaco and go to a sweet, you know, restaurant and be like, you know, you know, everyone yeah. stoked that we're in a casino. But we'd also go into like these tiny villages where like people knew him and they were like, they wanted us in their house and they wanted to show us their, their lives, you know. And, and once you get that and you get that kind of access, you just and you just are able to open up and just let it wash all over you, you know, and just really absorb like what that is all about, what their lives are about, what the experience of being in a foreign context and learning all those things are about. And again, you always have those root commonalities where you realize like, man, we did, like most of our concerns are the same, you know, yeah, most of our things are the same you know, and, and like, that was the best. And, and also that that show, what was great about that show is like kind of built into the philosophy of the show and how we went out into the world was like the idea that we're like guests, you know, and that was really refreshing because in a lot of television production, a lot of entertainment, people go out with like a, a very kind of arrogant, you know, perspective. We are, we're, you know, we're Hollywood and we're coming in and we're going to, you know, we're going to, make our show and move the pieces around the way we want. And, and I guess that's what I mean about the difference between the two kind of subgenres and like reality and documentary is like in reality, there's a lot of that, a lot of going in and saying like, like I'm sitting in an office and, you know, in the West Valley in LA and I'm making a show about the, you know, I mean, you know, throw it yeah. dark, you know, like uh, making a show about Oman, right. And the Bedouin and, you know, in the empty quarter of Oman the fuck do i know <laughs> i don't know anything you know what i mean yeah. i gotta i gotta i gotta figure out what they're about and then and then construct the show out of that where a lot of times in in television production it's people sitting in an office like this and being like i'm gonna write the script and then we're gonna go out and cast it and we're gonna go make it happen and i think the fact that we went out as guests and we went out with humility and we went out with a with an openness led to us constantly being able to be surprised and allow the the kind of magical stuff that you don't expect that you can't script that you can't predict to happen and we also just got really good at capturing that and i think when people appreciate the show when they watch it that's what they're seeing is that yeah this is real we're not lying to you this is authentic and uh and and there's some real magical moments that that happen out there you know yeah like your place, that, put yourself in the right place and be open to it you know 100 percent. and that's so that's gonna be my next question but i wanted to tell you this first yeah. real quick because as you know with this podcast like we have like a schedule link so i did not plan this but yeah. yesterday i because i just realized so yesterday i interviewed Lori wooliver oh so, Lori, yeah it's fantastic yeah, yeah, so, that's yeah. amazing so yeah, yeah. It's just so I, I wanted to tell you because like I didn't purposely line it up like the next day. Like I there's no way I would have been able to predict it. <laughs> but like literally, yeah. Oh my god. So you've yeah. been like fully uh fully born to aid now. I mean, what Dude. what am I gonna say? Lori is <laughs> Lori's, you know, Lori's the 
<laughs> no, no. No? Well, yeah, no. So, I mean, her um, and yeah, her her podcast will probably go live in probably like a week or two. But cool. um, but yeah, no. So that's my next question, and I wanted to ask you because yeah. it's kind of fresh in my mind some of the things that she yeah. had mentioned. But yeah. what are and look, you had so many amazing experiences, so it's kind of hard to say this was better than this. But like, what are some of the ones that you like remember out of all that traveling and being with the crew that? Like yeah. I guess the question would be like, what are the first two or three that are in your mind right now that I've like brought? Yeah. See, you know, I always kind of like my I always really liked the kind of more, I guess, I, I don't know. For me, like if, if you're gonna if you're gonna say what are your favorite experiences, I'm not gonna pick out like all the the like super fancy restaurants and sweet hotels yeah. we stay at. I like like I like I like the the kind of more rough and tumble stuff. I, I mean most of us, okay. I think. Yeah, so I, going to Bhutan, Bhutan was Bhutan was insane. That was super cool because we also, you know, a lot of these shows, it's like you're on a finite schedule, you're on a finite timeline, you're trying to make the show happen. So you you do got to answer to certain things. And so yes, we get immersed in the culture, but we get a somewhat limited view because we gotta we gotta hit a schedule. We gotta you know we gotta we gotta deliver right. Yeah. Um, Bhutan, though, we drove across the country. Um, and and I mean, on like exactly what you would picture, like a ribbon of dirt that goes through the mountains, you know. Oh, yeah. And it's a road that's being constructed, and it's being constructed by basically Bangladeshi and Indian um uh, construction workers that live up in the mountains as they push this road forward. It is, it is sketchy. You know, this place <laughs> a thousand foot drop on the side. We had to stop because a gigantic boulder had rolled down into the road, you know, I mean, it's all, all of that stuff, you know, yeah. but along the way we'd stop at these little kind of waypoints where they had put together literally like a tarp, you know, like a tarp tent over a structure and it would be like a little pot bellied stove in the middle of it. And you go in and it's all the workers and you know, are warming up and then us, you know, in these benches kind of around these pot belly stove and they make like, you know, ramen soup and doctor it up with, you know, the, the local, uh, you know, chilies, like, like Bhutanas, green yeah. chilies, you know, and like chili, you know, chili oil. And all of a sudden you're sitting there eating it, like drinking a cold beer with these workers from Bangladesh. You couldn't have come from more different contacts with everyone sitting around the stove there <laughs> that kind of stuff to me was like that was precious I and mean, that's gold you know yeah. um so that that comes to mind uh the one that you know I, I keep telling i told on tim's uh tim ferris's podcast too though um yeah we were flying around uh when we were down in antarctica we had like basically unfettered access to uh helicopters and so in Antarctica, that's that's what you want, because it's the only place to get anywhere or the only way to get anywhere. And, um, you know, there are people who have been going down there for 10 seasons and never been off McMurdo because you've got to have access to the helicopter time. Right. Um, we got a ton of helicopter time. And so w one day we got picked up uh, and we were taken out just to shoot B-roll and basically get in the get in the get in an A-star with a pilot who had just come out of uh, Afghanistan uh, flying Apaches. And he was like, what do you want to see? And I'm like, man, what, what do we know? You tell us what we want to see, you know, just take us for a ride. You, yeah. You know, and so, I'll take you for a ride. So, <laughs> I mean, you know, you you got you got one of the best pilots, best train pilots in the world. You got Antarctica and a helicopter. We just went and flew around all these insane canyons and ravines. And, you know, we'd pull up on, it'd like pull up and land on a cliff. And we're like on a cliff with like a 2000 foot drop with a valley in front of us that's bigger than Manhattan. You know, uh, just the scale of it, you can't imagine. We did that all day. And on the way back, we're, we're flying back and we had to stop for fuel. They got these little refueling stations kind of around. And so, you're working a refueling station right in antarctica you're like a three-person crew that's out there for an entire season in a place that looks like hoth you know it's just like yeah. you're on the glacier it's just ice and it's you and several hundred 55 gallon drums of jet fuel you know? <laughs> but we go when we land here and these people come out uh the people who work there of the little um the little kind of you know a hut i don't i don't want you want to call it a hut it's a you know no yeah yeah a, no. A decent living situation for that condition yeah. uh with this 
big pot of pulled pork uh, and coffee. And we're like sitting there with the, the rotors are still spinning. We're pumping jet fuel over this one of these 55 gallon drums, like eating pulled pork sandwiches uh, and drinking coffee, you know? And it's like, man, what, what did I do, you know, to yeah. land? I mean, this, it's the coolest thing you can imagine. And so there were a lot of experiences like that. Oman, I, you know, anyone who's ever gets the opportunity to go to Oman should go to Oman. Uh, it's absolutely stunning, completely like out of a fantasy, you know. Really? Beautiful, okay. extraordinary okay. landscape. They've got gotcha. coral reefs. They've got uh, quasi rainforests in the in the south. You got these incredible mountainscapes. You got, you know, the the desert and the empty quarter of uh, the Arabian Desert touches into Oman. So sitting out there, being out there at night with the Bedouin in in the sand, uh, that was totally unique. Just yeah, incredible. Man. I'm similar to you with that. I mean, look, luxury stuff is always. That's always nice. Nice. But, <laughs> uh, so like, and actually, when you're traveling that far, you know, business yeah. class wouldn't hurt, right? But at the end of the day, I think the coolest stuff, though, is being in the real, like when I traveled to Europe and Africa, I remember yeah. one when I went to Prague, uh, Czech Republic, you know, there's the main strip, if anybody ever been there, there's like a kind of main touristy part. And yeah. if you just venture off like 20 minutes, then it gets into where like the locals actually are. And like, I, yeah. I, went, yeah. I was like, where are the locals? That's where yeah. I want to go. Yeah. Um, so it seems like you were similar in that. It's just like, I want to, yeah. yeah, I want to be with the locals, the tour. I don't need to go to KFC in Africa. You know what I mean? <laughs> like I know what a KFC is. Like. No, though I got to say at the, at the end of a long Africa trip, uh, I'm, I'm hitting KFC yeah, so yeah, hey. in the airport and like, you know, in uh, Doha on the way back or something. Hey, no, and, I, and I'm not hating on that. I think it's great. It's, no, just, no, no, uh, totally. it's not my focal point as well. <laughs> no, but you, you know, you're totally right. And like the whole, you know, the base philosophy of that show was finding those places and seeking those people out, yeah. getting off, the, getting off the path, you know, and, and that was, you know, but, but, it, but also understanding that like that, that has many faces that that particular experience has many faces that is that's a different experience when you're in rome as it is to when you're in you know like i said like central drc or ethiopia or you know it's it is uh i think it's 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 going with an an openness and an ability to recognize like the real stuff you know yeah and uh and and recognize authenticity and when someone is uh putting something in front of you and from an eating point of view when someone's putting something in front of you that they that there's like actual heart in that it's not just a commercial transaction you know yeah. you go to rome and eat nothing but commercial transactions and you're not gonna really experience rome or you can get off the path and look for a restaurant that doesn't have you know pictures of all the food with english descriptions on it and uh, and just have them throw anything down in front of you and and you're going to get something that has like a real piece of that place and a real authenticity to it and i think it's seeking that out which was the kind of base um the base philosophy and the drive uh for the show for and sure. then learning how through the various techniques that we had kind of developed uh as a team, you know, how to translate that for people and bring it into their house and uh, in their living room. Yeah. You know? and, 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 and we were successful, you know? So, yeah, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to ask uh, too about kind of like the creativity side of, of things. So yeah. I mean, like when you're doing one of these projects, like what is, and, and you kind of touched on it a little bit, uh, maybe it was like 10 minutes ago um, where you said like, you know, you basically just film and then, you know, you try to capture the moments in a sense, right? So it's maybe right. you like film a lot and then yeah. so it is the process really basically like just keep the cameras rolling and then whatever we like, or how much of it is, yeah. playing, you know what I'm trying to say? Like what's the yeah to a degree the end product, I guess is the, yeah, to a degree. I mean, like I'm a notorious overshooter, you know, and uh, you know, so um, anyone who's looking to hire me in the future, don't listen to this portion of it. <laughs> but, 
<laughs> I'm, I mean, I'm, I have shot hundred to one ratios on these shows, meaning that I've shot a hundred hours of footage for an hour of TV. As well. <laughs> Absolutely absurd ratio, but, um, but it's how it's honestly how, especially in the beginning, it's how I got the, the good stuff. Yeah. Uh, you then, you, you know, as you get older, you learn, you can get more developed in the industry. You, you learn technique and, and an ability to kind of predict those things and, and, and kind of sort out, you know, the wheat from the yeah. chapter or we got what we got is and if if for anyone who's watched morgan neville's film roadrunner about uh about tony um you know it, it talks about this what we got is we got fast we got we got to the point where we were very very quick um we had developed uh we had developed a kit we had developed techniques we had developed an understanding of what we were doing we had developed a shorthand with each other we had built a team that that was able to be really reactive and know, you know, when we see something coming down the road, like, oh, this is going to be good. This is going to be right for Tony. It's going to be right for us. And like, we're equipped to, we're equipped to jump right now. I would never, never, ever compare myself to anyone who had, you know, legitimately gone through military experience, uh, you know, but the closest thing I can kind of uh, relate it to is being kind of a, like a special operator within the military. You know, you are a very, very highly designed purpose built uh, unit that operates small, lightweight um with with excellent training and excellent equipment that is reactive and and that is trained to understand context and 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 react and and that's i think where we got is we felt that way where we 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 were really humming you know you, you look at you look at those as we really got going in parts unknown I mean, you look at those episodes, and we're just we're just cranking at that point, you know. Yeah, uh, sure. that was it was so exciting. Yeah, and that makes sense because, like, I mean, yeah, you guys basically created it. It, it just became like a rhythm almost, like a, a harmony was all there, and yeah. and dude, that's amazing. So, yeah. what, is there an average? I'm just curious because you said the hundred to one. That obviously does sound like wild. <laughs> is there yeah, like? Wild. In, is there like an industry standard, like five to one or something, or is it just dependent? No, I mean, no, I don't think there's an industry standard. I mean, it, it, this is, I, I mean, this is an interesting thing that's going on in our industry right now within, within documentary. I mean, you have this massive, massive push for content right now um, as all of these various platforms scramble for content. A huge amount of that is documentary and reality, right? But what you're getting increasingly is people who come from like a narrative background and have those kinds of expectations from a managerial side on the, you know, within the, within the networks that are expecting that kind of accuracy. And we're saying, hey, listen, like, it doesn't really work that way. This is documentary. You know, you got to be able to be willing to withstand an X factor. Like, we can't answer every question in advance. Like, this is finding a story. This is finding a path. This is shooting and stuff is going to hit the editing room floor. And that's going to be frustrating for some people who come from a narrative back background where everything is so hyper planned out and where you have these incredible artisans and technicians. And I mean, if you've ever seen a feature film crew work on a big budget feature film, it's absolutely amazing what the, the the talent pool that is brought together on a film you have all these people executing this one very particular kind of hyper focused vision that's a very different animal from what we do you know we go out and we're like you know eyes and ears open absorbing stuff shooting throwing stuff to the side you know moving through the story moving story elements around we're literally scripting it out as we go we, mm. we plan we have a schedule you know we kind of need those things to keep structure but there's a looseness and you have to play free safety on stuff you have to that's how you do it well that's that clashes a little bit with some of the some of the philosophy of the of the platforms right now so we're 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 in a little bit of growing pains in this industry right now because of that very dynamic I and mean, if i go back to some of these platforms with 101 rate 100 to 1 ratio they're going to be like dude what is your problem <laughs> Yeah. I'm looking for it, you know, I'm searching yeah. for it, you know? Yeah, no, it makes, I mean, 
in my opinion, and again, I mean, obviously for the editing team, that would be a lot of work, but you'd rather overshoot than undershoot, right? Because if you undershoot, yeah. you can't do shit about it. You have to go back and shoot again, right? I yeah, mean, totally. But it's like loading a barge too, man. Like you want to carry as much coal as you can, but you don't want to sink the thing, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, and like, you know, you can do that too. Like, you know, I've, I've you know, I've definitely gotten my fair share of, uh, of pissed off editors. <laughs> uh, I'm like, well, yeah, but you know, we're in the jungle in Guyana and we we're there for 10 days and I don't know what the hell is going to happen. And I don't know what thing that happens now is going to be relevant and, you know, down the road. I, I don't, you know, and as we go along, it's like, you know, at first, like seeing the anaconda on the side of the river, that was the most exciting thing. And that was going to be the, the thing that was like the most exciting thing in the show. 10 days later you're like oh yeah i remember that remember that snake <laughs> you know <laughs> it's been through so much other shit that's like amazing you gotta shoot it all you know yeah see that's a great point because there's actually um he, he's a youtuber his name's casey neistat i don't know if you ever yeah. heard of him, but one thing that i think like why he's become so popular is that he like he shoots so many things and he like dates everything so you'll be yeah. watching like one of his vlogs and then yeah. he'll like flash back to like two years prior. And if you're like a real fan of his, you're like, Holy yeah. shit. Like, how did he have that on file? Like, how did he like, like <laughs> That's you awesome. yeah. yeah, you know, yeah. so like, yes, I mean, sure. Overkill is like a real thing, but at the same time, you're correct. Like there is relevancy that you could only know in hindsight. Right. So absolutely. And yeah. that adds flavor to it. So that's cool. You, you do not have a script, you know, yeah, we do not have a script and 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 you know we need to so we need to react yeah for sure and yeah in a jungle literally anything you don't want to miss like i don't know a monkey or something jumping <laughs> like that that that's the fucking thing you I want so. yeah yeah um that's right but uh so what i want to do now man is like just in case if there's anything that you wanted to cover that we didn't i want to uh leave the floor to you and then also um you know let people know like how they can stay in contact with you like websites socials and all that stuff you know, I have, I like, I have a, I have a several, you know, I have a couple thousand, you know, fairly disappointed Instagram followers, but I'm not, it's not really my jam, you know, uh, yeah. I don't, I don't do a ton of social media and stuff like that. I, I'm, you know, I do, I do kind of this, you know, sure. never been a great self promoter, you know, I love talking about it. But, no, uh, no, no, sure. yeah. <laughs> Is there anything like, do you want uh, other stuff? Yeah. I mean, um, you know, there's a, there's the, I just, I, I got to mention the third show and in, in kind of like that chronology that meant, you know, has meant so much to me is, uh, you, you know, a show I worked on called United Shades of America with W. Kamau Bell. I don't know if, you know, people are familiar with him, I think, you know, through the show, but also he just released the, the documentary on Cosby. And uh, I just got to give a shout to like that work and being able to work with Kamau. It, it was kind of amazing because, I met him, you know, I met him in Kenya when we went to film in Kenya with Tony and, uh, and this is two months before Tony died. Um, and it was almost like, just, it was like the passing of a torch, you know, um, ended up going on after Tony died and working with Kamau for three years at a time when like, we got to focus like on, on our country. You know? So after all this time, of being out in the world uh, and learning about, you know, other people and telling other people's stories all around the world. We got to like go in and look at our country at a time when our country is like really hurting. And, you know, I don't care what political stripe you're from. I've hung out with everyone. Like I said, I, I appreciate everyone on a human level. I may have some different opinions than you, but the fact that we got to go out and really examine that and jump out into the world, I, that meant so much to me. And to have like a very, very brave voice in come out who's willing to like really kind of shake the structure up. Um, that was another very powerful experience and, uh, and one that um, was kind of like very important, you know, to me as well. So those are, those are also shows worth, uh, checking out for better or worse, whether you agree with like our, you know, kind of social and political conclusions or not, you know, um, I think the most important aspect of that is I would hope we can all kind of stay in dialogue. We work through this, this rough patch. 
You yeah. Know? So. Dude, I think that's the most important part too. It's like whatever side you're on, I think the discussion needs to happen. And I think that's the hardest yeah. part that I see yeah. on both, like so many YouTube channels, I find like they're, they just like, if they're on one side, they'll like have a whole video and all it does is bash the other side. Like it doesn't present a solution. It doesn't conversate. Ooh. And it's like, dude, that ain't, I mean, let's, let's play that out for a little and see where we end up. It's not going to be where we want to be. It's not good. I mean, you don't have to read a whole shit ton of history to know that that doesn't end well. Yeah, you know, I was I was talking to someone today. I was actually talking to, to this gentleman, uh, Chris Saburn. You know, he did Chris. Chris invented and designed the Adidas Superstar. Oh yeah, okay. Shoes of all times. I was talking to him today, and I was telling him about work we had done in Montana and something I love so much about Montana is like, and and you know, listen, Montana's changed a lot. A lot of billionaires have come in and really kind of like bought things up and stuff, but. I'm talking about like old school kind of classic Montana. And, and I think folks from Montana will understand what I'm talking about. Montana was a very mixed political place. You had labor based Democrats that came out of places like Butte, where you had really, really strong union roots. Uh, and then you had conservative Republicans, you know. And so you would get in Montana, you'd get ranchers that live next to each other. And they're like, one dude's a Democrat, one dude's a Republican, one dude's liberal ish. And one dude is conservative, you know within yeah. you know and uh and they can't hate each other you know they can't not talk to each other because like in the middle of february when you're calving and and it's three in the morning like you need that dude and he needs you man and you're <laughs> gonna end up working together getting shit done and and going and having coffee and breakfast and talking about your families and realizing like man, we are all in this lifeboat together. And if we get in a fist fight in the lifeboat, we're in big trouble, yeah. you know? Lifeboat's going to say, man, we can, we, can, we can talk to each other. Like, it's cool, you know? It's all right. You can be frustrated. Like, you, it's a, you're allowed to be frustrated. But the point when we get violent, the point when we shut down conversation with each other, we're in trouble, man, yeah. you know? I hope we can get over that. And I hope that the work that we've tried to do over time as documentarians, I'm certainly not just talking about myself, you know, has, has helped in that respect. You know, if we keep getting the stories out there and we keep talking about each other and we keep sharing and we keep being open to, to people that we consider to be other than ourselves. I, I think, I think we can be okay. You know, I hope, so yeah. I guess I, I get off my soapbox now, man, but, <laughs> <laughs> no, man. but it's important, you know. No, it is super important, man. I think it's pivotal, especially in in today where we're at. Um, yeah. But uh, but, dude, thank you again for coming on. Thank I really you. appreciate it. Yeah, I'm so stoked. Thanks for reaching out, Tyler. Appreciate it.